these offerings I'm creating are specifically towards QTPOC standing in their power, understanding their inherent worth, inherent worthiness, and making commitments to the self to stay powerful so that they can serve others and also reap the rewards. You know, you know, when you are powerful, the universe protects those who are, who are acting from a sense of purpose and power. And so my excitement is about that protection being extended to people who are most vulnerable. Jamila Reddy is a Brooklyn-based, North Carolina-raised, Black, queer, Buddhist writer, healer, thinker, doer, and dreamer. My name is Gibran Rivera. I'm a facilitator, and this is my podcast. Here, I am inviting you into a conversation with remarkable leaders who are devoting their lives to the evolution of consciousness and culture. In this episode, Jamila and I talk about so many things. We talk about being black and young when Michael Brown was murdered by police. We talk about the transformative medicine of grief. We talk about what it takes to let go of your limiting beliefs, about getting out of your own way. We talk about Burning Man. We talk about radical self-expression and about so many other things. I know that I left this conversation vibrating with excitement and aliveness. And I think it's going to do the same for you. I can't wait for you to give it a listen. Jamila, it is so good to be with you today. Thank you, Gibran. Same. I am very excited for our listeners to, to get to know you. And I am looking forward to telling them more about you. But uh, lately, I've been experimenting with asking a, a belief question on the podcast. I don't, I'll tell you why I'm asking it. I, I feel like we're in a day where everybody's kind of getting really cemented in their beliefs, right? And it's almost like, I am right, or you are right. Everything is really binary. There doesn't seem to be a lot of place for growth. And when I think about my own life, uh, for example, an example I can give you is, I grew up Catholic, but I grew up very Catholic. Like it wasn't just a cultural Catholic. And I remember spending time, like mental energy, uh, intellectual energy, in uh, something called, uh, in theology, it's called apologetics, which is kind of the theological arguments for the faith, you know? And it was both intellectual and spiritual, and it was almost like I had to give a lot of energy to making this very specific argument about a, a, a manifestation of God and about the role of our religion and why this religion was right and others were wrong. And it amazes me how much energy, how much I embodied that uh, at an earlier stage in my life and, and how far, like how I just would spend no time right now arguing for that or for that particular religion or, or, or any really, right? It, as a kind of like, let me dismantle your belief systems so that I can uh, uplift mine and persuade you that mine are right, uh, it seems very far away. It doesn't seem like I can't even believe that it embodied that so much passion and commitment was held in something that is just doesn't even hold anymore. It's not like I have a different like it's not like another set of beliefs like won the argument. It's almost like I'm on an entirely other level of thinking around, around how all of these things work. And I just thought I'd give you one example of a big one for me and give you a chance to think about yours. Yes, it's, a, it's such a beautiful question. And what immediately comes to mind is the belief that, I say belief, but really I want to say delusion, actually, that um, <clears throat> other people are responsible for my experience. And I think that was a belief that I held very strongly as a young person, as a child, that I carried with me for quite some time into my teenage years and then early adulthood. I mean, I'm still in early adulthood. Uh, but this belief that if I was 
um, having a hard time. There was a there was an external reason. There was a circumstance. There was a catalyst. There was a there was some cause that existed outside of me that was to blame. Um, I could attribute it to this person, this conversation, these words that were spoken. This is the reason why I feel this way. This thing is cause for my feeling or my experience. And now my belief is that I'm, I am responsible for my experience, in fact, and that everything that I experience in my internal world is a result of a cause that I made. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a result of a cause that I made. And so I no longer believe that other people have control over my, over my world, over my internal world. Wow. Uh, this is really exciting for me. And it's a very powerful place to, to begin this conversation. I'm going to tell you what, why. And, uh, and then I want to get into like what you're working on so that our, uh, our listeners get to hear it. But I, this is too, too exciting to not kind of jump right into. Um, I share a similar understanding of, of life, right? And one of the reasons why uh, I'm excited to talk to you is because you are younger than me. I, I understand you to be in a, in a different generation yeah. from mine. Uh, I understand you to be a millennial. Would that, do you call yourself a millennial, Jamila? I, I Technically, yes. I don't know that I... I think I very, very rarely use that language to self-describe. Yes, I am a millennial, indeed. <laughs> So technically, yeah, I appreciate that, that you're way more than that. So what I hear in what you're saying is a powerful sense of responsibility, right? Like you are taking responsibility for your human experience. And oftentimes what I kind of wrestle with out there in the world a lot, particularly, you know, I spend a lot of my time, uh, most of my time facilitating in spaces that are working on, on social justice, right? And I feel like in those spaces, there's often a direct tension between a thoroughly held structural analysis, right? Like this is all screwed up. Like we are actually subjectified to a, an experience of oppression that is actually limiting our freedom. And, 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 and I believe that to be true. That's why I'm like, I work on all of this. At the same time, I can see how holding that analysis often keeps us or the people that I work with from taking the kind of responsibility you're talking about. There seems to be a direct tension between one and the other. I, I, I often think about like, how do you apply the tenets of like the human potential movement, right? To, to anti-oppression work, right? Like that's one of the things that I wrestle with a lot. And I'm just like curious because I know, and I, I'll talk a little bit about how you and I know each other, but I know for a fact, right? That you are committed to justice, right? Um, you and I have been in an action together in the unlikeliest of places. So I know you hold the same commitment. Um, how do you hold those? How do you work with that? So it, the, your question makes me think of another origin story for truly the person that I am today, which is around the time, and it makes me emotional always to think about it, around the time that Mike Brown was killed and Black Lives Matter, the, the words were um, just sort of echoing in the news and in the kind of collective consciousness, I remember it was a it was a, such a turning point for me because I felt like I had to defend or explain I matter. Mm -hmm. I kept thinking Black Lives Matter, and then I kept thinking, well, I matter, I matter, and that feeling of I matter became personal. And so when I was thinking about myself being important, it revolutionized the way that I understood myself Whoa. and thus the way that I, that I treated myself, not just externally in terms of, you know, okay, uh, eliminating toxicity from my 
um, you know, social spaces, uh, not eliminating, reducing, <laughs> uh, distancing myself, but then also kind of starting the process of purifying my inner world to reflect this deep seated belief that I matter. And Mm -hmm. so that is sort of where that those wires crossed for me because I started to understand that my life, my life is important and my inner life that really is about my inner life. The quality of my inner landscape affects the experience that I have in the world. Um, And so I think to answer your question, the way that I connect those two ideas of the sort of external, the very real external circumstance and the belief that we are all responsible for our experience is that there's a, there's a level of permission that is required within myself um, to allow the harm to be planted. Mm-hmm. There are these seeds, I kind of think of it, I love the metaphor of a garden. And I think about it all the time as externally, there's all these little, you know, pollen floating in the air, seeds, you know, flying about. And, and I always have an autonomous choice about what I allow to be planted and then further every single day, what I water, what I nurture, what I uproot. And so the reality is that the seeds are constantly being planted. But what we can control on the individual level is what we nurture within us of those seeds. Wow. This is, this is very beautiful and, and very insightful. I'm so appreciative of the nuance that you bring to it. And I'm, I'm moved and I find myself hopeful. I really want to be in ongoing conversation with you about this because it seems like the very same set of events, right, that might have made so many people turn towards what I often call like performative wokeness or like movement fundamentalism, right? Like to get rigid, right? In face of, of the, of the, in face of the, in face of the conflict, it seems like it, it sent you in, in a different, beautiful and healthy direction that actually, in my observation, allows you to, to better contend and to better contribute to the very same, to the very same concern. Um, it's a, there's something there that's precious. And um, I hope we, we, we keep looking at it together. Thank you. Yes. yes. And in, in truth, there was a journey to this, to, to this belief still. Right. Because my initial response was, like you said, the closing, the self-protection. Yeah. And I, I had this big thought when I was still actually holding the belief that other people were responsible for my experience. And I thought, I can't listen to this. This is, this is disrupting my, (laughs) you know, this is interrupting my inner world and I'm going to disengage. Like I, I don't want to be suffering. And I understood that there was a sort of physical violence happening, you know, to these, to these people. And it's still happening to people all over the world, but there was a psychological violence also, which was the impulse to shut down and disconnect. Right. And so I was aware, I was like, wow, the, it is a function. It is actually a function of, of this violence to make people's spirits shrink and for us to close and disconnect. Um, because when we're closed and when we're disconnected, we're not, we're not acting from the heart. We're not, we're not allowing ourselves to feel anything. Mm-hmm. Sadness, hurt, uh, compassion, energy, you know, being galvanized to make, uh, to make a choice. So I understood, I could feel and see very clearly that if I allowed myself to shut down, then I was essentially giving my oppressors a win. That's what they wanted. They wanted me to not be engaged because clearly when I'm engaged, this is the work we do. Right, right. That is also the activism to me is to stay, is to do the inner spiritual work for myself so that I'm never letting myself be closed off to receiving or offering. Ache, no, that, that makes so much sense. That, that really resonates deeply. Is that eternal, it's like, it, yeah, it's, it's ongoing, right? It's like it, you, we keep doing the work within so that they can do the work 
the work without. I I am so resonating with your journey, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll we'll get back to it when we talk about the action that that we were in recently. Um, but I want to make sure that uh, that people know what you are working on. Uh, what is the thing, the the project in your life, right? Like the kind of contribution uh, to the world that that is turning you on right now. What is what what are you doing? So there are many at the moment, um, and one thing that I feel really energized about right now is introducing people of color, queer people of color, queer, trans, Black, Indigenous people of color to meditation and breath work and doing that through um, in-person offerings, but also virtual. Um, But just kind of, again, planting those seeds in people that I I feel truly, um, because of our position, in these bodies, which I don't believe in coincidence, you know, I'm like, I think about all the time, like I could have been born in any physical vessel. And here I am in this black, queer, gender non-conforming self. Why? Like, what is it about this experience? And, and I think it's the, um, what excites me about the introducing QTPOC to meditation and breath work is that there's, um, there's a particular, vantage point or a seeing that is that is possible from this perspective. Another belief that I held long ago was that I was only disadvantaged or only, you know, there was this kind of binary view of you're either in a, you know, if you're a white, cis, het man, you're in a position of power. And if you're not, then you're not. And I had to really challenge that for myself because I I know that in my in my position, in my identity as a black queer person, I see so much that so many folks can't see. And so the project I'm most excited about is working with this particular community because the perspective is so expansive and is so vast. And the understanding of gender as fluid um, and the understanding of identity and self as fluid is something that I think a lot of QTPOC hold as a universal truth based on our experience. And so it feels so urgent and important to me that these people with this expansive, transformative perspective be equipped with the inner resources um, and start to cultivate the inner abundance needed for them to not only start sharing their gifts, but to also gain some of that abundance back, to have some of that be fed into their lives. Because so much of us, so many of us are still struggling. So... These offerings I'm creating are specifically towards QTPLC, standing in their power, understanding their inherent worth, inherent worthiness, um, and making commitments to the self to, to stay, to stay powerful. Yeah. So that they can, so that they can serve others and also reap the rewards of, you know, you know, when you are powerful, the universe protects those who are or acting from a sense of purpose and power. And so my my excitement is about that protection being um, extended to people who are most vulnerable. That is beautiful. Jamila, I, it, I, I love the clarity of it. And even more importantly, I like love the way you, you transmit it. Um, you embody it. Um, you hold it, right? I think there's... Uh, there's in many cases a gap between kind of the realization of where we need to go and our our and where we are in relationship to it, and I guess there will always be a gap. But what I'm experiencing with in you as we speak is is that this is something that you that you're practicing and embodying, and it communicates it communicates very clearly uh, through you. And I'm, I'm appreciative of it. Um, thank you. I want to ask you just a detail, a couple of details here. Breath work, are you meaning like holotropic breath work or uh, what kind of modality are you, are you talking about there? I'm curious about it. Yes. So I, I don't have a specific modality that I work with, um, but mostly my interest in sharing with people is just quite simply for people to develop a relationship with their breath. Um, and so when I say breath work, I don't mean any particular kind of practice, I'm just introducing people to the idea that 
their breath is a tool that they have access to at all times. That's beautiful. That sounds pretty big. Ba- it's like the basics and the clarity of the basics. Yeah. The, the simplest and the most profound. <laughs> If you've, if you've never done holotropic breath work, you should check it out. Holotropic, I'll definitely. It's like a way to literally journey. In fact, the, the guy Stanislav Grof, who started it, he was one of the early researchers on LSD. Then LSD became illegal, and he wanted to continue to study those states uh, without using substances. And uh, he developed this powerful modality. So if like, I, it just sounds to me like something you might be you might be connect, you might be intrigued about. Definitely, yeah. Uh, also, I mean, maybe then the, there's so much to cover, but I did hear you speak of ritual, and um, that's something else that I'm also very very um, interested in the reclaiming of ritual, right, as ways of making meaning and understanding. I feel like so much of uh, of Western culture is about like the head and the book, right? The head and the text. And uh, when we eliminate our ritual, we eliminate so many important ways of knowing. Um, and so I'm curious to know um, how that's coming into into your work in the world, into into what you're up to. Ritual, how ritual's coming in. Yeah. I mean, when I think of ritual, I think of something that one returns to with mm-hmm. intention. Right. And so the ways that that shows up in my own life are my meditation practice. Um, and I also have a journaling practice that I have a right. tool of being in deep conversation with myself on the page. Um, and it's a space where it's kind of the, the stage where a lot of the, the drama <laughs> of my internal life happens on the page. And I, and I've been journaling. I'm a writer. So I've, I've been journaling since, I mean, I have dozens of books somewhere in this house. There are dozens of books, journals. Um, But those two rituals of just sort of sitting with myself and creating the space with the intention to notice what's going on and, um, yeah, to notice what's going on so that it's not it's not sort of just happening, but I'm that I'm aware of it, that there's consciousness around what is happening in, inside of my brain <laughs> and inside of myself. Um, so those are the two rituals that I have, but outside of that, that's it. Cool. I, I love it. I keep like, yeah, you keep kind of bringing me back to like, this stuff is basic, Gibran. <laughs> You know, what I mean? and I, it's 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 so important because I think it makes it like way more accessible to to live well, right? When this is kind of the stance that one state that one takes. I'm a huge fan of journaling myself. I'm wondering, uh, what's your approach to that? Just just so that our, our our listeners learn something about like how how do you do, how do you journal? So I have a couple of practices that I kind of flow in and out of, and. And I've now built the muscle. I mean, I I explain to folks all the time, like developing routine is really like, it's a physical endeavor. It requires a lot of like muscle building. All right. It's like a physical endeavor where, you know, you have to go, you know, if you, if you're trying to run a, um, a triathlon, you wouldn't just show up on the day of and, you know, try to go in there without having months or weeks of preparation with your physical body. And so, I developed the muscle for journaling via morning pages, which is a practice Julia Cameron of The Artist's Way suggests um, first thing in the morning, three stream of consciousness pages, and they can be whatever. And I love that Julia Cameron explains this practice as it's not writing. It's not writing in the way that we know it, such that we're trying to intentionally craft meaning or, or to be coherent that it's simply when I when I when I do morning pages, I think of it as I am the um, I'm transcribing. I'm not writing. <laughs> I'm not journaling. I am simply listening to the thoughts in my head and transcribing them, whatsoever they may be. Oftentimes, I'm cold. Don't know what to write. You know, sometimes the very basic, just this is the thought. No judgment. Just just record it. Just recording it, so that at the end, it kind of feels like. Um, I have a 
I have a document that says, okay, and this morning, this is what was going through my mind. And I often don't read my morning pages. Um, I just sort of write them. And then you know, I use, I have somewhere like a 99 cent composition notebook. So I intend that the practice is not precious. I'm not holding on to these things for my big revelations or anything shareable. It's just sweeping. It's just kind of the daily um, decluttering of my mental space. And, and I, I, I return to that practice often, um, but I, it's not a daily one. I don't, I don't do it daily. Uh, but now my journaling, I take notes. I'm an avid note taker, which also feels like journaling. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe some folks would not call it journaling, but that's another way that I, that I process information is to, is to just let it sort of settle through my mind, but then also to kind of make it physical. That is kind of, it sort of um, kind of locks it in for me to write it down on paper and to see it in front of me, to have the words flow from my hand feels like a very embodied way for me to learn. So, so journaling usually looks like that. Um, I'll also sometimes stage conversations between my uh, sort of my highest self and my, you know, whatever the other part is, <laughs> whatever the other part is. Um, yeah. But I'll sort of stage conversations and, and let both of them, and actually a therapist suggested this exercise, but I'll do that on the page. So I'll write down the kind of the fear thoughts if I'm, if I'm thinking through something I'll let that voice have full, I'll just give it an audience. And again, I'm transcribing like, okay, go. I'll write down everything you say. And then I give my highest self an opportunity to respond and I'll write that down too. Uh, so that's another practice that is really helpful just to be able to discern, um, you know, and kind of separate the kind of um, the wisdom from the, the thinking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, this this is all this is all amazing stuff. I do. I am a fan I of morning love pages. pages. Um, I, I love it. and I thank you for like outlining those three. I they really resonate for me. Um, they seem like brilliant practices. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about Burning Man, and there's a couple of things I want to talk about there. Uh, First of all, I want to tell our listeners that that's how we met. Um, first, virtually, because I went to my first burn last year, and, and you were not able to make it, and, and we can talk about that as well. Uh, but even even though you weren't there, I remember just brief exchanges with you on our listserv, on our camp listserv, Kaviva Camps listserv, just, just feeling like... Yeah, this is somebody, this this person and I, we, we vibe well together. And then this year we were we were together on the playa and it was beautiful. It was epic. It was such a wonderful, wonderful burn. And um, the first thing I want to ask you about, I and mean, I want to ask you to speak about it more broadly, but there's one thing that you said that that stays with me. And, and, and that's how I want to invite us to enter the conversation. I think you said you've been something like eight times or or a good no. That was my sixth. Your sixth time. And, and, and you said, I have been able to bring these principles into my life. Yes. Right? And, and I, I, that's, you know, I want to hear what your feelings of the Burning Man in general are, but I, I'm curious about that. And, I, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. Um, I facilitate retreats. That's a big part of what I do. Another big part of what I do is our whole ceremony, sacred ceremony. And so I'm now on my second burn, right? And so this idea of hold of being a part of um, extraordinary experiences or experiences that are different from from day to day life, it's something that I've given a lot of my energy to. And what I've learned over the years is that the most important part of it all is integration. Is what of it? Do you embody? What of it do you go? Do you bring into your your day to day life? Right in in this kind of late stage capitalism, experience can just be something else that you accumulate. You know, it can be just something else that you try to put in your pocket. I did this. I did that. But without the integration, it means it's just that. It's just an experience. And so when I heard you say that, 
and say it on a stage and say it with a microphone and embody in the power of it, it stayed with me. And I knew that when we talked together on this podcast, I had to ask you that question. Yes, I love this question. And I there are two principles. So for those who don't know, Burning Man is um, a community that is, the, found, the foundation is these 10, is it 10 or 11? I think it's 10. 10 principles. And there's sort of these uh, community agreements about how people are to interact with each other and with the space. And the two that I felt like I really fully um, integrated were radical self-expression and uh, gift economy. And so for me, radical self-expression meant, well, first, my experience at Burning Man is someone, I don't know if someone or the playa or the mountains explained, but I understood that that radical self-expression is in in and of itself a gift. And and I started to think about self-expression as an offering. And for so much of my life, and this is like my biggest little racket, my biggest story is that I'm too much. I'm too, I'm too artsy. I'm too weird. I'm too, whatever the too much of, you know, whatever the stories are, that me expressing the fullness of myself was somehow a burden or an inconvenience. And my experience at Burning Man was reframing when you are radically self-expressed, when you allow what is true on the inside to be fully seen and expressed on the outside, it is an offering. It is a generous act. And so that, you know, in my mind, my, my little small me self was the generous thing is to not, is to pull back, is to create more space for others, is to not take up too much space with my own expression, but, but to be the facilitator and to kind of shrink so that there's more space externally. And my experience at Burning Man helped me see that, no, the generosity is, in fact, in giving of myself and in showing and allowing myself to be seen. And another thing that helped me uh, sort of integrate was that I used to think that there were, you know, there's like political art, that it had to be rooted specifically and explicitly in social justice and I wanted to know, okay, how does this, how does this change the world? I wasn't interested in art if it wasn't political. And I had a very sort of like, you know, if you have a stage, if you have an audience, it is your responsibility to send a message. And this idea of radical self-expression and, and even just being at Burning Man helped me understand that art and authentic conversation and moments of connection that is also that hard open things that open the heart. It it's political in a in a different in a whole. I mean, it sort of um, transcends politics, and it got me thinking about my offerings not always having to be these sort of um, kind of. I don't have to be in the streets protesting in order for me to be doing activism, right? It kind of changed my understanding of what sharing looked like and what giving looked like. And so, mm -hmm. and so I started to think, okay, like showing up in a world, um, oh, and then the other principle of, uh, of, of gift economy, of the constant energetic exchange of I'm giving because it delights me to give. That is the reason that I'm giving because it is for my benefit. <laughs> it delights me to give. And when we all hold this value of it delights me to give, then we're in constant exchange. That is, that is what it is. Um, we're in constant exchange. So, so the gift economy principle was really illuminating for me because I started to see, oh, when I'm generous, I'm rewarded. I don't know if rewarded is the right word, but that definitely the more that I think the more that I center myself and how I can be of service to other people, the more my desires come to fruition, the more joy I experience, the more pleasure, the more alignment, the more freedom, that they're proportionate, 
when I am giving from a, from a place of sincerely wanting for the happiness and the delight and the wellness of someone else, I'm planting seeds for my own happiness, delight, and wellness. And, and being in at Burning Man and just seeing the kind of micro, I mean, it's kind of the immediate lesson, you know, like someone, you know, you offer, hey, I've got a peach. You know, you've been in the dust for five days and I've got this juicy peach. And then someone's like, oh, I love this. I would love to read you a poem. And you have this just gorgeous exchange that the the sort of endorphins, you know, of, of that kind of immediate um, exchange really helped me understand like, wow, there's, this is how human beings are intended to function actually in this exchange. Yeah, uh, this is how, it, how it's meant to be. The, I am so uh, I'm really moved uh, by by your description and 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 your, how you speak about this integration into your life uh, at so many levels. And I gotta tell you, I definitely felt connected with you at camp. But this conversation is really um, illustrating for me, like just how much I resonate with 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 you. It's it's really lovely. Um, and it was funny because when you were speaking about radical self-expression, what the, guy, the note I made to myself here is like, your expression is so generous, right? And then you spoke about the gift, and I was like, it's like generosity upon generosity, right? It's like, and and just a little personal aside, I'm a I'm a voracious reader, like I'm a, may, maybe to a fault, right? But never, I don't think ever had I had a book show up in my dreams, like read this book, you know, like the book was so clear. And it was uh, a book by Lewis Hyde, a classic book by Lewis Hyde called The Gift. And it is all about about this reciprocity that you're speaking of, right? Um, anyway, it just came out for me as you were talking. I thought I'd recommend it to you and, and the listeners. And I said, way of saying like how closely I feel like I'm vibrating with what you're saying. I wanted to ask then, as, as we both, I think, um, uplift uh, the Playa Burning Man, this experience as, as important in our lives. And, and you know, you've, you've made this, you know, you've been there six times. Uh, and I, I left last year knowing I would return, but not convinced I would return this year. And then I left this year being like, I just, I'm a burner until the spirit tells me that I'm, that I'm not, you know? And, and I know things change, but I feel really committed to the space and to that experience, to the community that we have, that we're building there together. And so we, uh, we had what we think might have been the first action a Burning Man, as far as we know, right? Um, our camp helped to organize the first action because Burning Man is one of the STEM principles is radical inclusion. And yet it's like 1% black, right? And it's just like a tiny little numbers of, of people of color. And it's like a huge blind spot there. And our, and our camp engaged in this action. And I'm just wondering, um, I really would love our listeners to hear your perspective on that. Because I, th I think, and tell me if I'm projecting, but I think that, that maybe, like me, there were moments of like negotiating with ourselves. Like, okay, like, is this what I want to do at Burning Man? You know what I mean? Like, is this the thing that I want to be doing, right? Because of how you and I both talked about other kinds of activism. Um, and I think I saw you turn towards it with a full heart. Um, I turned towards it for, I know I cried, uh, being so deeply moved by it multiple times. And I'm just curious, like, can you tell us about it? Can you tell us about this action that we had yes. uh, on the playa? So we held an action to invite the Burning Man organization, the, the staff and the board and the founders to invite them into a collaborative conversation about how to embody and um, integrate this principle of radical inclusion. And knowing that as a camp of primarily people of color, we've all had such transformative experiences at Burning Man where we've been able to play and to connect and to witness art and to heal, to dance, to be with each other, to shed old stories, that we wanted to be able to extend that gift 
to other people of color. Because again, as I mentioned in the beginning of the conversation, there's some people whose identities make them more vulnerable in the world. And we understand as a camp that if the folks who are you know, historically and traditionally marginalized have access to healing transformative spaces, that, that everyone benefits. And so this action was an invitation to Burning Man to, to do this work with us. And we delivered a petition to, to the organization. Uh, we marched together and um, we shared our stories about our time at Burning Man as folks of color um, and why it feels important to us on an individual level to increase diversity on Playa, to increase representation of people of color and people of other marginalized identities, people with disabilities, people who are deaf, et cetera. Um, so this was a, it was actually a fraught experience for me because I, oh, I just, it hurts my heart to see the people that I love so dearly, that I cherish, being wounded by toxic white supremacy, which is actually what is happening. I mean, it is poisonous. And so I, I had these few moments where, you know, my beloved campmates would come home, come home, <laughs> come back to our camp, and I would just see their energies deflated, you know, or feel the, the sort of heaviness. And, and, that, and that complicates my relationship to the offering of inviting Burning Man into this conversation, because if the price we're paying is our wellness, then it's too high a price to pay. The benefit and the gift of Burning Man is that, and, and actually I'll say the gift of our community in Keviva is that we hold each other so dearly that there wasn't enough time for that poison to really <laughs> settle in. It's like, uh-uh sucking it out immediately, like loving on you, laying hands, making sure you're fed, making sure you feel good. Um, so, so it was a useful, a useful experience for me to witness that kind of immediate restorative justice, for lack of a better word, when people go out into the world. It's kind of Burning Man is the microcosm for so much of what happens in the world. But when, when people go out into the world to advocate uh, for culture shift and for for a better experience for all of humanity, it wear there's um it wears on them, and so it got me reflecting on what does our activism look like if we take all of the energy. This is a post burn reflection. If we take all of the energy that we're sending out, what does it look like if we bring it in? And that's the question that I'm left with in terms of the growth of our camp and the evolution of our camp and how we move forward in relation with this organization that has been unresponsive um, to, to our invitations, essentially. So, so the question I have for myself and for us is what, what might it look like for us to redirect some of the energy that we have in the past however many years of Que Viva's existence that we've put out, um, what might it look like if we decide to pour in? So that's a question I'm sitting with now. I am uh, excited. I am excited and compelled by that question. I I, I can't tell you that uh, I haven't asked it. You know what I mean? Um, it, I know that I know that I am um, moved by the effort. I know that I was moved by the project. And I know that before going, if I'm honest, I, you know, I was a little apprehensive about it, right? Because again, it's not, it's just not how I'm moving in the world these days. Um, uh, and so, so your question really intrigues me and I'm looking forward to, to being in inquiry with you about it. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, uh, Jamila, I, um, I, I want to totally permission, like you telling me, hey, I don't, I don't really want to talk about this in the podcast. But I, I was, 
looking through your recent Instagram post, your Instagram is so beautiful. Everybody uh, should definitely follow at Jamila Reddy on Instagram uh, and uh, will be in the show notes. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just beautiful. I, I love your presence there. But you referred to the passing of your sister. You referred to the passing of your father. And so because you did that in a public forum and because I know it impacted you coming to to Burning Man uh, last year, I, I wanted to see uh, what you can tell is you know, you're so joyful, right? And it seems like these tragic things happened. Um, and I just, uh, I know that grief can awaken us and it's some it's part of what you apl- you implied in that in that recent Instagram post and I couldn't let the opportunity of asking you to share more about that wisdom with us uh, I couldn't let that pass yes thank you for the question and I'm sincerely grateful every time for the opportunity to talk about death and grief because so much of the pain that the entire human you know all of humanity experiences is because Grief and death are pushed into the darkness and they're so natural. They're natural and inherent. I mean, they're unavoidable parts of the human experience. And so I'm grateful always for the opportunity to talk about it. Um, So thank you for for inviting me into this conversation. Um, So my sister died last August, uh, actually two days before I was supposed to fly to the Bay for Burning Man. And it was, it was a lot. It was sudden. Uh, She overdosed. And after having been sober for several years, for about a year and a half. And so it got me thinking, 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 because I was, I was angry with her. She left um, her three children who are now, 11, 8, and 1, whom you might hear. <laughs> you might hear mm-hmm. the list one waking up from a nap any moment. I'm here at my mom's house. My mom is now taking care of my sister's children. And for so long, Gibran, I held just anger. I was mad at her. I was mad at her for leaving. I was mad at her for leaving her kids. I was mad at her for not reaching out for help. I was mad. Um, that I had to, I was having such a beautiful year. I got engaged. (laughs) I was coaching. Um, I'm no longer engaged. (laughs) We can talk about that if you want to, but I was mad at, I was mad at her was blaming her for interrupting my experience. I don't want to deal with this. And grief is not something you get to choose to deal with. So I was just having so much anger and resentment and the discovery that I had to come to was that she was medicating actually Mm -hmm. that she was using these poisonous drugs to shift her internal state towards one of stability, which is what we all want is to be able to move through the world from a grounded place, from a place of feeling in control. And so my experience with Shamin helped me understand that she too, and actually my grief experience, because it was the darkest grief I had ever felt. It was the deepest pain I had ever felt. And in my pain, I recognized this is the feeling that she wanted to get out. It was so clear. I was like, oh, this hurts. I want to get out of it. I want to get out of it. I want it to go away. And then I thought, wow, so did she. Mm, wow. So did she. This is this. And if and if this feeling persists, I can under I just understood. Mm. I understood it not to be sustainable for the feeling to persist. And so I thought, wow, Shamin, you you were hurting and you wanted to get, she was hurting and she wanted to, to heal. And so I, I had to ask myself, okay, this was her, this was what she had access to. And I mean, addiction to those toxic drugs is immediate. And so I had to ask myself, okay, what is my medicine? 
Mm-hmm. What is my medicine? And how do I, how do I be with this pain? Not get out of it because there's really no getting out of it. But what do I do to be with it in a way that it does not destroy me? Because if this in this way persists, I cannot. I mean, it just became unbearable. It felt like I was in you know, my physical body. I was, it's grief is, is physical. It's visceral. It's emotional. It's spiritual. It's, it's psychological and it's physical. And so I had to ask myself, okay, knowing that every single human being experiences this depth of sadness and of pain. We each have to find what our medicine is. What's mine? And joy was the answer. It just had to be proportionate. There was no other way. It had to be equal or exceeding the grief that I felt. And again, I'm saying this knowing that there's no, we don't control, I can't control my grief. It's like a wave. It's like the ocean. It is a natural thing that comes and goes as it chooses, (laughs) as it will. But I, I understood that the joy was my defense. It was my protection. And that feeling the joy gave me permission and the knowing that I could be in grief as dark as it got because I knew that the joy is also there. I know that it's there. I know that it's coming and I know that it's been. And so just like grief in waves, joy is also in waves. And so I started to give myself permission to be with this grief in the same way that I gave myself permission to be with joy. It became non-negotiable that it's not an option. It's not like a frivolous, it it can't be like a one week vacation that I take in August where I go to the desert and have a good time. And the rest of my life is sort of this neutral, okay experience. My need for joy became a matter of my life. And so it was my medicine. Dancing was my medicine. Um, Laughter was my medicine. Movement, just the, 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 fully present in delight and care and feeling good became, yeah, it was just, it became non-negotiable. And, and in, and I felt justified. And I think that like a lot of, you know, I'll speak for myself. I think I carried a lot of guilt in the past, feeling like I had to justify my pursuits of pleasure and joy. There's, you know, mm-hmm. oh, I felt like um, I needed a good reason. And then I, and then with my sister's death experience, I just realized life is the reason. Yes. Life is a good reason. The fact that I am still alive, the fact that I am a human body, that I am a person with consciousness in the world is reason enough for my pleasure and joy. And I felt justified. There's a, there's a phrase in, in Buddhism, those who have suffered the most deserve to become the happiest. And I etched that thing into the very fiber of my being. I was like, I deserve it. I have paid, I have, I have, I have paid the price. You know, I have done my grieving and I deserve it. And and I deserve is language that sometimes feels a little bit complicated because I think we're all inherently deserving. I don't think we have to do anything to deserve goodness. But it gave me permission. The experience of, of, of feeling the grief gave me permission. I felt allowed. I felt like, you know what? You got it, boo. It's been really hard. You go ahead and take that extra hour for lunch. You get to do that. You go ahead and take that vacation. You are allowed. <laughs> and so it became a way of living in the world as an act of resistance, not just resistance against the grief that threatened to pull me down because there's grief and then there's darkness. There's darkness. And there were a few moments where I just felt myself being pulled into the darkness. And the joy is what helps me stay afloat. Wow. I can swim in it, but my head is above water always. But I am, I'm in it. Okay. I'm trying yeah. water. I'm over here, but but I'm breathing through it. And that's what the joy did for me. Also, my sister's name, Shamin, is a French word for path or uh, a road. Mm. Her middle name is Joy. 
Whoa. So her name is Pasca Joy. And I, and I thought, you know, what is, what is this experience teaching me? And, and it, it quite literally has become my experience with my sister as now an ancestor has become a path to joy. It led me straight to it. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you for dropping that wisdom, that embodied, embodied wisdom. Uh, what a beautiful and powerful transmission. I am so grateful for it. Thank you. And it resonates very deeply. Thank you. Thank you for uh, thank you for going through that pain, so that you can bring this light forward. Uh, feeling deep appreciation and gratitude, and resonance. Um, and uh, of course, to say I'm sorry. I'm really sorry for for the loss, but but really receiving the gift of that. It feels like. Um, I know that from my own experience of grief, one of the things that it gave me, and I can I feel it in you when you were talking about understanding her pain, is it makes you more compassionate, yes. right? You just become more compassionate. Yes. Um, I am. Uh, I've been working through. I mentioned it a lot in in in, in the podcast. Uh, this book called "The Wild Edge of Sorrow" mm. by a guy I believe called Francis Weller, and it is it is it is a book. You know, I, like I mentioned already, I read a lot. It's fairly like it's one of those books that defines a decade. You know what I mean? Like a really important book on on grief and on what you're saying that this culture turns away from it, and by turning away from it, we deny ourselves the wisdom that is on the other side of it, right? Like the wisdom of the elders is the wisdom that is on the other side of sorrow. And, and uh, it seems like you are truly, truly embodying that wisdom. You're communicating it. And I'm, I, I am sad that it had to take this, this degree of a loss and that it's up for her children um, and for your family. And, and I also can see that this is, this is the way of life and that you're bringing so much life to it. So I just wanted to receive that with, with a lot of heart. Thank you, Jamila. Yeah. Oof. It feels um, a little challenging to transition from something that powerful, but it's so good. It is so good. It is so good. You gotta shake. Yeah, shake a little bit. It's holy. It's really holy. Um, thank you. Um, we're coming... Towards the close, and I, I close with um, with these two questions I ask um, at the end of the podcast. And one of them, you know, it feels like a left turn. It, it always does in the podcast. But one of them is um, instead of a commitment uh, that I have made to myself, uh, that when I'm in the presence and in relationship with, not just random presence, but in relationship um, powerful women, I want to talk about... Uh, I want to talk about men and the role of men um, because I am a cisgender hetero man conditioned in that way that has um, hurt people through my own patriarchy, the patriarchy that moves within me. And I um, committed myself to to the work of atonement, right? And, and so what I ask women, in these days, it's kind of post Me Too world where, um, where we are finally, men are finally forced to contend with this course. Um, I'll, I feel compelled the need to ask women like you, um, what do you say to men? What should men do if we want to be better? Let me think about that. It's a beautiful question. Mm. I think men should attend with great care and love and patience and gentleness to their own wounds, truly. Because when you say it's been embedded in you, I mean, it happened, it happens as children. That it begins as as a as a small human who has just emerged from the cosmic universe, and and these small children are I mean it's like the seeds are planted and watered and 
you know, they grow into farms and then you're serving produce, you know what I mean? And so, and so my, my, my invitation would be to, to, to tend to that, to tend to those wounds. Um, because so often I think there's the, the myth or the delusion that there's got to be um, a this role of protection and um, control. And really grief is an experience that makes one feel out of control. And so mm-hmm. giving yourself permission to heal the wounds, just to attend to the inner child, you know, the little, yeah. the little you. The little you were, that was, you know, vulnerable and innocent um, to spend time developing a relationship with that and rewriting all of the information, just hearing it, noticing it, acknowledging it, and then writing new scripts, writing new scripts. So I, if, if I was told not to cry, rewriting the new script that my tears are an act of generosity, that they're healing for myself and everyone who's with me, but that attending to the wounds, I think is the healing of the self must precede healing of others. And so if there are to be offerings made um, of atonement, then I think they have to start with um, attending to those wounds and just, yeah, going back to the place um, where those wounds occurred and, and writing, writing a new story, you know, Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Resonates deeply too. And uh another another you just keep dropping pearls of wisdom over here. And I appreciate the compassion. Um, the deep, deep, deep compassion in that response. I'm I'm holding it tenderly. Um the the last question I ask is um it's like requires like a, a, a moment of light touch facilitation in which I invite you to time travel you know, 20 years into the future. 20 years is what we used to say was a generation, right? And you know, most, much of what you have been working on right, has, come, has come into fruition, right? Some struggles are still there because they always are, but you've attained and, and you've learned and and you've manifested in the world, right? And so we don't have to tell us about what that looks like. The The question then is, if you time travel back from that space, right? Embodying all that you know then, what advice, what would you say to yourself? And what would you say to us um, from that wisdom, with that wisdom? I would say that it's about decisions, but your life is a matter of the decisions that you make and choosing for yourself a life of ease and wellness, wholeness and joy. It's a choice and it's a choice we return to. It's not a one time decision, but I would, I would offer myself and to everyone, be willing to make the choice over and over and over again. Be willing to make the choice. To choose freedom and choose authenticity, choose connection, choose to keep the heart open, choose courage, choose vulnerability, you know, choose love, choose, choose. You've got to choose the things that you want. Make a decision to claim them for yourself. Um, yeah. And, and never stop choosing. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Well, Jamila, this has been beautiful, um, unexpected, rich, generous. I am, uh, yeah, I only want more of you. Uh, thank, thank you so thank much you. For, your, for your generosity. I cannot wait for this to get out into the world because you are a gift and uh, you're bringing something really beautiful and I want my friends to hear about it. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And I, thank you, Gibran. I must say, being in your presence at Burning Man really was a turning point for me to just see you so 
joyfully and um, in such a grounded way offer opportunities for us to connect and heal. I just saw you like a beam of light. Every time I saw Gibran, I was like, oh, Gibran, I feel like you're a mirror to me. It's such a way that I feel reflected by your brilliance and your kindness and your magic. You've got such a magical energy. And I felt um, witnessing and, and experiencing your brightness made me want to generate more of it for other people. I was like, I want to do that. You are definitely a person. When I see you move through the world, I am reminded of what I'm doing. So thank you. Wow. So generous again. I got goosebumps all over. Soul meeting soul, like meeting like. Uh, we are in each other's life now, Jamila. We really, really are. And I can't wait to see what emerges from here. I love you. Thank you. I love you. I love you. Yes. Thank you. I know. I wish I could hug you. I know. <laughs> I know. Thank you for such a beautiful conversation.